Welcome to episode 278 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me from the road, my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. Episode number 278, the most improbable Seahawkers podcast episode ever. <laughs> this, was, this was tough to get in this week, man. I'm not going to lie. But we hit. We did get it in between the goalposts. We almost, we almost doinked it off the left upright. But it, yeah. we're just getting it in, just inside that left upright. I think snuck it in. Yeah, better, better than Jason Myers with that. To be honest, so yeah, especially on that first one. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, going back to the Carolina Panthers game, we'll talk a little bit about that. Look ahead to the upcoming game against the Arizona Cardinals. And uh, we got some other news, uh, Seahawks news going on, some kind of bummer news this week, more so than positive news. But I guess let's start off with the positive news because going back to last Sunday with the win over the Carolina Panthers, the Seahawks moved to 7-1 and one with their road record. With the Rams' loss to the Cowboys, they clinch a playoff berth. With the 49ers' loss to the Atlanta Falcons, they get back in the number one seed in the NFC. Man, if you if you rewind back to Sunday night, uh, Seahawks fans were riding high. Oh, for sure. I mean, the good performance against the Panthers, considering too that the defense was missing like half all of our dudes and like a lot of the good ones. No Jadevian Clowney, no Shaquille Griffin, no Ziggy Anza. And then you had guys like Quandre Diggs go down during the game. Bobby Wagner went out for a bit. It was mm-hmm. kind of scary when he was down on the ground wondering, you know, what was wrong with his knee. But fortunately, he gets up and sounds like he's going to play against Arizona. Right. Sprained ankle. So that that's great that Bobby will be out there. Uh, defense still a bit of the walking wounded to this point. But, you know, the team put in a decent performance against a really terrible Carolina team, except for the fact that they didn't seem to understand that the entire offense was either screen to McCaffrey or screen to McCaffrey or jet sweep there. They did mix up some jet sweeps in the second quarter. That's right. That's right. And uh, yeah, we were getting gashed on the perimeter. It felt a little like the Rams game where we got gashed on the perimeter, maybe a little bit of a, you know, marker of lack of team speed. I don't know what it is, but uh, Do you think it's the because defense- they focus so much on stopping the run up the middle that just bunching up so many guys in between the tackles that uh, that other teams are looking at that and saying, okay, with the speed, we can beat this team to the outside? Might be a little bit of that. And also, too, since they do play so much base defense and keep all three linebackers in there, that basically you're not spread out as much with uh, you know extra DBs out on the edge as well to help contain the perimeter. And so I think maybe offensive coordinators look at that as an area to exploit, and they well should because, boy, howdy, it's uh, it's easy to exploit. Um, with that said, I mean, the Seahawks got out to a big lead lead in the fourth quarter only to give it up and break all of our hearts uh, so that we don't have uh, a, a nice blowout win. Just yet another ho-hum, less than eight point win. And uh, I've decided that it has been somewhere adopted into Washington state law that the Seahawks are forbidden uh, to win by more than seven points. <laughs> Well, only two wins this season by seven points or more. So they have. Yeah, nine. they must have gotten fined for it or something. So that's why they they shy away from it now. Or Pete Carroll's, you know, just a fan of taking down records because the New York Giants back in 1986, they had nine games where they won of that close of a margin. So with two games left to go, the Seahawks have a pretty good chance of breaking this record and being the all time team to to be within that close of a margin of so many wins. Yeah, let's hope that isn't this uh, upcoming week against the Cardinals. Hopefully they beat them by more than seven. But yeah, the Panthers game was interesting in the sense that you wanted to see the offense come out and play well. They did. Uh, Chris Carson looked great. Russ looked good. You know, that was one of his better performances in the last three, four weeks. Um, You saw the receiver step up. Tyler Lockett looked like he was back. You saw Josh Gordon with the huge catch, which was exciting until about Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just... A lot of good things on the offense. DK Metcalf looked great. The offense finally looked like it was going to kind of break out of the slumber it's been in the last few weeks. And they're going to need it again uh, coming up here down the stretch. And because I I don't know about you, Brandon, come away from that Panthers game. And I understand like pretty much half the defense was injured. Right. But man, that defensive turnaround that we were kind of feeling, I don't know that it feels like it's gone back away. Like it just disappeared. And we're back to that defense that we saw earlier in the year. And it's, it's a defense that isn't going to take you far. 
Well, do you think it has uh, anything to do with the fact that Quandre Diggs was out in that fourth quarter and then combine that with the lack of pass rush? Because that's the thing about that fourth quarter is that Kyle Allen had all the time in the world to throw downfield to DJ Moore. And it just felt like, you know, he found the spot in the zone. He'd zing it in there. And with no pressure on him, he could make those throws all day. And that's the frustrating thing is, you know, in that situation, down 20 points in the fourth quarter, that's all they're going to do is drop back and pass. Yeah, I mean, you could try to pin it on that. But unfortunately, in the Rams game just the week previous, like Quandre Diggs was there. Clowney was playing. And they ate us alive on crossing routes. So I, I don't know. It's tough to it's tough to get a beat on this defense. You know, we watched them in the 49ers game come out and really dominate and play awesome. And you felt like it all turned a corner and then it all feels like it is regressed again. Well, you mentioned the fact that Russell Wilson is now linking up with his receivers. Big game to Tyler Lockett. Lockett sets his career high with 994 receiving yards for the season. Still two games to go. Uh, he just needs six yards now to become the eighth player in franchise history with a thousand yards. You know, we talked about DK Metcalf a lot last week. He passed Doug Baldwin in this game. He gets a touchdown and uh, it moves up to number two behind Joey Galloway. So with the departure of Josh Gordon now, it uh, at least you have those guys that you can count on. And maybe Luke Wilson coming back into the lineup here this week. And along with Jacob Hollister having a pretty good uh, go of it these last few games, I, I feel like they're going to be okay. Yeah, I mean, the offense is not really a huge area of concern in the sense that uh, Russell and the receivers have seemed to gain a, a bunch of chemistry this year. And really, Josh Gordon, he had come in and he'd made a couple big third down catches. And that was about it, minus the bomb in the Carolina game, right? Right. Which was a beautiful throw by Russ. Oh, well, it was a beautiful throw, but it was an even better catch with just off his fingertips and his ability to catch it with like his pinky and, and ring fingers and bring it into his body and hold on to it, go into the ground. That was incredible. It was incredible. And uh, I, I was really excited to see him start to come into his own. I was really hoping that, you know, it was getting to a point to where he felt comfortable in Seattle and that maybe he would find a productive future there, but it looks like that's not going to be the case, which is super unfortunate because I don't think he's a bad dude. Yeah. I just think that, you know, he's a guy who's gone through some tough things and still has some demons he's struggling with and, you know, wish him the best. There's no doubt about that. Well, busted for controlled substances and apparently performance enhancing drugs. And you couple that with. Well, the all right. So let's talk about that for a second, because I've seen a lot of people trying to parse the way that that was worded by the NFL. Yeah. And people just assuming that it's both. No, I think the reports were that it was both. The reports that I saw that he had violated the PED or the substance and PED abuse uh, language in the CBA, right? Yeah, because there's two separate Aren't policies. Aren't they the same thing? No, they're two separate policies. Oh, I thought it was just the drug policy. No, they'll they'll always announce that it's either one or the other if it has to do with one in particular. And mm. then, uh, so this way, the fact that they announced it as both, yeah, it uh, that's a bummer. Yeah, well, double bummer then. And then because with Al Woods, you didn't see anything about controlled substances. It was just performance-enhancing drugs. And now... They lose Al Woods for four games. Yeah, and that's the bigger loss, really, when you're starting to look at these suspensions between the two players. We've relied on Josh Gordon for a couple big catches, but it's not huge. Where Al Woods is you know, kind of that clogger in the middle that you need to help stop the run, and that's really what this defense is supposedly built all around. So uh, losing Al Woods, I think that's going to hurt a lot, actually. I do think so, because even looking at the pro football focus stats, when you look over the course of the season, it has been Al Woods, who I think you ranked only behind guys like Bobby Wagner and uh, maybe one other guy in terms of uh, run stopping ability. Yeah, very effective. And really, I guess we're going to have to rely on the likes of Puna Ford, Quentin Jefferson, and Jaron Reed to really pick up the slack. I think it is possible and it is something they can't overcome, but this team needs to get healthy going down the stretch. And Getting into the number one seed as they had this last week with by the benefit of Dan Quinn giving us a gift, they really need to make sure that they hold on to that so that they can use that bye week to get healthy. It's just these injuries are piling up. 
Yeah, he's at number four behind Bobby Wagner, Jadevian Clowney, Quentin Jefferson, and uh, Al Woods is number four. They're just ahead of Puna Ford in terms of run defense. So uh, a, a big hit to their run defense, and that's going to have to be something they overcome along with these injuries. And I'm kind of wondering, with this game coming up against the Arizona Cardinals, yeah, you look at the injury report, and there's not uh, a ton of guys who look like they're going to have to sit out. Clowney listed as doubtful. Quandre Diggs listed as doubtful. And then you have Shaquille Griffin, who is questionable. He did practice on a limited basis on Wednesday and Friday this week. He didn't practice on Thursday. But uh, you have to think that he might be close to, to being ready to go. Michael Kendricks, apparently a full participant in practice this week, along with Ziggy Anza. So there might be some guys who are going to play in this game that didn't play in last game. But you have to think guys like Clowney and Diggs, you want to rest those guys for sure and have them as healthy as they can be for that game against the 49ers. But as we saw with the 49ers game against the Falcons, that they, they, they lost to a Falcons team that we beat pretty significantly early on in the season. And, you know, maybe they're looking ahead just a little bit, or maybe the 49ers are just, they, they had their bye week early on and around week four, and they've just, maybe they're starting to wear out at this point of the season. Yeah. It seems like that defense maybe peaked a little earlier uh, than it maybe needed to. And that's going to be a problem. Well, they got a lot of injuries too. Richard Sherman was out. Sure. Uh, absolutely. But there, I mean, you have no business losing to the Falcons at that point. But I do look, that should be a wake-up call to the Seahawks, how quickly this can all change and how important this Cardinals game is. Because I went back and watched a little bit of Cardinals-Browns, and this Cardinals team looks a little different than it did when we faced them earlier in the season. And it could be very easy to take these guys for granted, let alone the fact that these divisional games are always tough. The Cardinals always play us tough at home. I don't know what it is. It's annoying. And I just want to see that streak kind of come to an end. But this Cardinals game is huge. It's every bit as big as the Week 17 matchup against the Niners. Well, the the streak did come to an end last year. The Seahawks got both wins in the 2018 season. But yeah, go back to the end of 2017, and they lose to the Cardinals. Go back to the end of uh, 2016, they lose to the Cardinals. This is a team that can come in and get a win, and especially with a guy like Cliff Kingsbury, you know, wanting to show that he can finish strong. And they did that against the Cleveland Browns. That, but the Browns, you know, they were right in there. I was thinking that that was a give up game for the Browns, but really they were in it up until about that field goal miss at the end of the game. And they just kind of fell to the wayside in the fourth quarter. Yeah, that sounds like the story of the Browns this entire season. <laughs> sure. But they didn't quit. They didn't quit right from the beginning is what, is what my, my main point was. Oh, they kind of did. They ran with Nick Chubb for a little bit right out of the gate. And then all of a sudden they forgot their best player on the team is their running back. And yeah. they stopped handing it off to him and put it in the hands of mediocre Baker. Like, <laughs> just what a joke. Like, that, that was a terrible game plan. But looking at the Cardinals, like, Kenny Drake really looked amazing. And he's looked very good for them in a couple games since coming over from the Dolphins. Mm -hmm. And with Al Woods now being gone and Bobby being nicked up, all these, uh, Quandre maybe not playing, I'd say most likely not playing, Clowney most likely not playing, who is a very good run defender. You know, stopping Kenyon Drake is going to be a challenge, and it's got to be the number one thing that the Seahawks focus on going into this game. It is, and it and the offense is a little bit different. You mentioned you know just how different it is, especially with Kenyon Drake versus David Johnson, who is still number three on the team in receiving yards, but he's number three in rushing behind Kyler Murray, who is leading the team, and then Kenyon Drake at number two already, despite just coming to the team you know partway through the season with the Dolphins. So uh, David Johnson's really fallen off, but they they now who? have. <laughs> I know you you mentioned that last time uh, we played. No, the I mean Cardinals, I'm dead but... serious. Who? <laughs> He's the guy that's uh, making big bucks for them at, at the running back oh. spot. Oh, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Bob Anderson was that his name? No, it's it's another generic name. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I I just remember I was supposed to think he was good there for a minute. Well, they do have a couple other good pieces on offense with Christian Kirk, although it sounds like he's questionable for this game. But Larry Johnson, who never seems to go away from the NFL, maybe he still has a whole nother season in him after having another solid season leading the team and receiving yards. It's, uh, I mean, you, oh, Larry you, Fitzgerald. Okay. I'm sorry. What did I say? Oh, you said Larry Johnson. I was very concerned. Uh, I, yeah. I was, I was like, he was a basketball player, bro. 
Well, there's uh, all these all these generic names on the team. I, yeah, Larry Fitz. Yeah, yeah, he's a yeah. Yeah, but, Hall, future Hall of Famer Larry Johnson Fitz. Future Hall of Famer Larry Johnson Fitzgerald. Yeah, the receiving core does have a lot of talent there. And one thing that I did notice after watching the Cardinals a little bit from this last game compared to when we played them earlier in the season, their offense was very horizontal and a lot of like quick bubble screens. Kyler just getting out of his hand fast, uh, throwing to you know the backs, that sort of thing. Never really pushing the ball downfield. And what I saw him do against the Browns is throwing a lot more deep outs, deep crossers, things like that with a lot more zip. They're not a lot, though. A little bit. Oh, yeah. A lot of his completions were like not behind the line of scrimmage, not two or three yard little little deal. Like he was actually throwing it down the field, you know, 10, 15 yards in comparison to everything being just bubble screens and, and quick outs and things like that that they were running earlier in the game. Yeah, so they've gone from a lot of behind the line of scrimmage throws to going 10, 15 yards down the field max. You still don't see a lot of deep throws. No, and that's not his strong suit. And I know they say it was when he was in college, but that was to guys that were running wide open by 35 yards. Right. In the NFL, that's not Kyler Murray's strong suit. And I don't know if it ever will be. Maybe it will. But I've seen some development out of him, at least, when I went back and just looked at this last game compared to when we played them earlier in the season. And I give him a little credit for that. It, they're an offense you need to take seriously. And they definitely uh, figured out how to use Kyler's legs a little bit more. And I I don't know. I, I think I see some growth in that offense. Well, speaking of Larry Darnell Fitzgerald, yeah, I, look, I looked up his middle name just as Larry we Johnson about. Darnell Fitzgerald. Larry Johnson Darnell Fitzgerald. Uh, okay, yeah. Named, he's the only active wide receiver to make the NFL All 100 team. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Guess who else made that list? Uh, Walter Jones. Yes, Walter Jones. He made the top 100 list. But the, uh, everybody else is dead to me. I don't care. <laughs> the wide receivers. They just announced all the wide receivers. And there's a Seahawks Hall of Fame wide receiver that made the list. Steve Largent. Oh, I don't know. I, I stopped paying attention to the NFL top 100 because I watched like two episodes of it. I was like watching the Masters slash a funeral, <laughs> right. like with the way everything is produced. And it's just boring and I can't do it. So I, I think that might have been even in your do better last week or right near it. But yeah, uh, Fitzgerald, the only active wide receiver. And here's the other list of names along with Steve Largent. You got Lance Allworth, Raymond Berry, Marvin Harrison, uh, Elroy mm-hmm. Crazy Legs Hirsch. Marvin Harrison, really, Marvin Harrison. M- Marvin Harrison jumps out at me as a, being a little weird to, to be on this list. Yeah. Is he better Is he better than Andre Reid? I can think of probably quite a few guys that I would put on this I mean, I might even. Well, no, I'm not saying Andre Reid deserves to be on the list, but that's kind of my point in bringing him up. You know, a guy who played for the Buffalo Bills, played in a wide open system with a great all time great quarterback, yeah. was able to compile numbers. Marvin Harrison's a compiler. Yeah. He might as well be Tim Brown. And you got Jerry Rice, Paul Warfield. You know, Tim Brown was the other name that I was going to bring up, as you may as well have Tim Brown on this list. But uh, Randy Moss, did I mention Don Hudson? Uh, those are the other guys. So it is, uh, he jumps out at me as being the one guy who is a little bit of a head scratcher. Yeah, he doesn't belong. It was good though. Seeing Walter Jones make that top 100. I think we would have had to riot as Seahawks fans. Now we got two guys. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, those are kind of the two guys that you would think would make the list. And obviously Steve Largent belongs. I mean, he had the whole time catch record there for a good minute, especially with Marvin Harrison. If Marvin Harrison would have got in over Steve Largent, we would have had problems. Yeah, now we're rioting. <laughs> that, that's what we would have rioted over right there. All right. Well, we've talked about the Cardinals offense. That Cardinals defense, though, they are not good. They are not good this season. It's a poo-poo platter, yeah. Number 32 in the NFL, uh, 413 yards allowed. Uh, the run defense, they're number 25 in the league. Pass defense, number 32 in the league. Even with a guy like Patrick Peterson coming back after six games. Yeah, again, I mean, he's almost another who? He's, he's had a rough year. He had a, he had a pick in the Browns game. He, remember when it was a giant uh, discussion who was the better corner, Richard Sherman or Patrick Peterson? Right. Look who's still playing at a pretty high level now. That's true. He's just out of gas. Yeah. He, he, all the Petersons are out of gas. Adrian Peterson, Patrick Peterson, the tank's empty. But yeah, no, that Cardinal defense, nothing to write home about except for Chandler Jones, uh, another compiler of statistics i don't i've never seen him as a dominant player but he does seem to kind of rack up some numbers here and there just sack numbers are relatively high but everybody else is a scrub 
on that defense, except for me. I like Buda Baker's play. He's, he's a scrappy guy. Yeah. But yeah, this is a defense that Russell Wilson and company should absolutely eat alive. And they may have to, they may have to put up like 30, 40 points in this game to come away at the win. And this is a make no mistake. This is a must win game. And it's crazy to be sitting at 11 and three at week 16 and say, this is a must win game against a putrid Arizona Cardinals team. Is it really a must win game though? Because yes. if, if they lose, can't they still beat the 49ers next week and, and then win the division? Uh, I went through the per- permutations like on Sunday, Yeah, maybe Monday. It's not Friday. I don't remember. <laughs> I, I, I got to go home for precisely 12 hours this week. That's it. Yeah. If according, according to the ESPN playoff machine, if both teams finish at 12 and four, then the Seahawks, they would have the edge over the San Fran. Right. But then end up maybe as a number two seed. They could. Yeah. You're, then you're counting on the Saints having to lose one of the road games and Green Bay having to lose, which they could lose to the Vikings. Mm-hmm. And the Saints, they're playing on the road the next two weeks. Saints are looking good, though. They're starting to peak at the right time, it seems like. The, the Saints, I think, are my number one team in the NFC, if I'm being honest with myself. The, the, one, the number one team that you fear? Yeah. Or the number one team in the NFC? Oh, both, yeah. Oh, okay. I, you know, I don't know. You could take the Niners, Saints, Hawks, put them in a bag, pull anyone out, and tell me they're the number one team in the NFC, and I'd believe you. I, they're that evenly matched to me. The consistency with the Saints over the last three years. I mean, the only reason they haven't made three straight Super Bowls are because of two wacky plays and then, you know, whatever happens this year. But, I mean, th- yeah. that, that should have been a Super Bowl team for the past two years. Well, at least last year. At no least doubt last about year, it. I guess you, you would have to say they would have to get by the Vikings and then beat the Philadelphia Eagles to, to go up right. against the, the Patriots. But... Yeah, there's a lot more ifs there. Whereas in playing the Rams, <laughs> there's and just having, one, play. one play you can yeah, point to. Yeah, and having the commissioner literally bend you over a barrel <laughs> and, and it do mean rules. things to you. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely. Which let's talk about that for a minute because how about this rule change? Now we're starting to see some of these pass interference plays get overturned. I think it was against the, the Cardinals and Browns where there was a, mm-hmm. there uh, was, there was a reviewed call right in the end zone. Uh, the defender got there a little bit early and it's kind of one of those bang, bang plays where in the past earlier on in the season, they would say just the play stands, but mm-hmm. they gave them the first and goal. Yeah, they did. And well, I guess Brown's cards didn't really matter in the playoff picture, but the whole point of the pass interference rule being changed was so that the NFL could save their bacon in the big games that really mattered in playoff. It, what I thought would be just the playoffs, but it's looking to be also playoff positioning. And I, I think maybe they're starting to do it here in week 16 and 17 to get the fans ready for when they start actually overturning stuff in the postseason. Yeah. They don't want to do it during the regular season. They only want to do it in the postseason. But it's frustrating as a fan when you watch and you kind of see how it's adopted early on in the season and then they completely go away from it. And then now seeing that it's starting to come back, it's just, you want rules to be enforced equally all throughout the season. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great if I had any inkling as to what pass interference was or what it, well, I got a better idea of what it catches these days. Um, I would like Apparently to know how, against the, the Falcons game and the 49ers though. You can't let it touch the ground and then lose control of it. Right there. Yes, yeah, exactly. It gets all confusing, but no, the NFL has been horribly inconsistent on a lot of the rules. And this is another instance of like, okay, so all that testing we did earlier in the season when coaches were like, ah, oh, you can overturn this. Ah, oh, you can overturn that. And they were like, nope, 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 nope. That's all data you get to throw out now because apparently the interpretation is totally different. Well, speaking of catches that should have been catches, how about Ugo Amadi? Apparently had a pick six ripped away from him, although it was kind of a pick and then a fumble and then a fumble recovery uh, for a touchdown if they would have. That was uh, an incomplete pass. No, no, I'm not going to. That was an incomplete that. pass. It was an incomplete pass. Great play. Great play by him. They called it yeah. right in real time. But uh, when you go back in slow motion, 
It's still not a catch. <laughs> he had two hands on it, had both feet yeah. on the ground. Yeah. It's three feet or a football move. He didn't do none of that. And then he lost the ball. So you should get penalized for that. Fine. I mean, he made a great, made a great jump on the ball and it was awesome to see him do that. I mean, he really does seem to have amazing ball skills. I mean, he, the few, the few limited times he's been out there, like he's been a guy around the ball and it's exciting to see. I think that was his first snaps that he's even gotten on defense this year. So no, we've seen him earlier in the year. Well, in preseason, I think. No, during the season, he's, I'm not saying a lot, like just a couple. Well, let me look at his snap counts for the season. Okay. He, he's been in the nickel a couple times earlier this year. Yeah. 46 defensive snaps this year. Thank you. There we go. See, I am paying attention. It was between. Okay. So this is all that we've seen him though. It was 20 snaps on defense in week one in the Bengals game. Okay. He played one snap on defense against the Steelers and then 25 snaps against Carolina. So it's, it's been a long stretch. Forgive me for thinking that the Bengals was practically preseason. Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I didn't say that like he's been in there consistently. I said he played, he played a handful of snaps early in the year. True fact. True fact. And it, it wasn't preseason. Right. All right. Well, one other guy who we got to see with a catch, even though it didn't count George Fant. With a catch out of bounds <laughs> in this game against the Carolina Panthers, Adam. I, it, I know it wasn't one of the highlights, but we need to talk about this. Honestly, that was kind of impressive. <laughs> he, I mean, there was no chance. I don't care if it had been you know, Randy Moss in that situation. He's not getting the feet in. There's no chance to get your feet in. Oh, no. On he, that just, play. he saw the ball coming his way, and he wanted to show that he could catch that. And I, the reason why I bring it up is because... One of the things that Pete Carroll said about Ugo Amadi in that one moment, he said he learned so much about the character of Amadi in, in that moment, getting the pick, being able to catch it off the bounce and running it into the end zone with confidence. He said he got so much from that. I got a lot from George Fant catching that ball out of bounds, just knowing how much he wants it. Yeah, absolutely. You can throw, it, throw the man a bone. <laughs> this is the game for it. I'm calling for it right now. And even... And all of you think I'm a George fan hater, but I, I want I want a three reception for 28 yards in a touchdown game from George fan this week. Let's target that man. <laughs> he deserves it. He, he deserves it for all the time that he's put in on the field. Uh, let's let's make it happen. They, they actually got him out running some routes. And uh, now all they have to do is get the man the football. There it is. Come on, Russ, pull the trigger. Sexy deep ball time. Now that Gordon's no, no. out, get Fant out there for a really critical third down catch. Yeah, yeah. On like a third and three, run him on a curl. <laughs> he can just box out the defender and then use them, them sexy soft hands to bring in the ball right there. Just don't, Fant. Just don't fall down uh, after you catch the ball and start running this time. Just catch it. Get the first down. I don't care what he does after that. Well, no, he's yeah. got to stay on his feet. Okay. And not fumble. But what if he gets tackled? Oh, no. I mean, he, he can't just oh. go down on his own. Like, or oh, get the no turf, turf monster. monster stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Well, anything else you want to say about this upcoming game against the Cardinals, Adam? Honestly, no, I've been on the road all week. I got, like I said, I got to go home for a total of 12 hours uh, this week. I haven't had a moment to think about any of this stuff. I pulled this entire episode literally right out of my butt. <laughs> well, if people are looking for more uh, Cardinals talk, I had uh, Ed Smith on the field goals podcast. Ed Smith, mm -hmm. what, he played tight end for the Falcons. He was on the uh, NFC championship team that went to the Super Bowl, And now he's a, a radio guy down in Arizona and had him on field goals. And, and he helped break this game down uh, a little bit more. Since I didn't listen to that and I haven't had time, like give me like his one big takeaway. Just that you're starting to see more of a development from Kyler Murray. But uh, you know, the one interesting thing was, is that, you know, hearing which guys he thinks might be with the team next year. Uh, obviously he, he thinks Fitz is going to come back, uh, but Patrick Peterson there, he thinks that, you know, maybe this is the year that Arizona tries to, to get a little for him and trade him. And he has no expectations that David Johnson will be back. Who? David Larry Johnson. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why he'd be back because he's not there anymore. Like he's not even there now. You, you never were much of a David Johnson fan. I think rightfully so. Have I not been proven right by history? You know what? He's going to end up being a Seahawk, just like uh, your other favorite uh, running back for the Packers, Eddie Lacy. That better not become true. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like my other uh, favorite Cardinals running back, Emmett Smith. Emmett Smith or Chris Warren? 
Who you got? Chris Warren all day. Emma Smith is one of the most overrated runners that's ever participated in football. I, I like I want to have that clip so that I can isolate that and I can send it to Chris Warren and then we'll get him on the show sometime. There we go. Hey, whatever it takes. I mean, I'd love to to speak to Chris Warren, but yeah. Yeah, you could put you could throw out a lot of names better than Evan Smith. All right. Well, we are getting into the second half of the show a little bit early. I want to welcome a new member of the flock, Robert Moreland in at twelve twelve. Oh, hey, buddy. So another new uh, Ring of Honor member. Yeah, we got another new Ring of Honor member. It's been a big year for the Ring of Honor. That's been, that's been cool. Yeah. Facebook Ring of Honor for our $12 donors at GetInTheFlock.com. You know, uh, Pepper in the Ring of Honor, he had a comment that I thought might be worth addressing. Well, it usually is when it comes from Pepper. <laughs> Says, I know I may get booed off the forum, but I've been a well, Seahawks. No. Yeah, I know. <laughs> when it starts like that, you uh, it's, okay. uh, it's, it's never a good sign. Yeah, I know that I may get booed off the forum, but I've been a Seahawks fan since the early, early 1980s. They drafted Jeff Bryant out of Clemson, and that pushed me over to what has been nearly lifelong fandom. In all those years, I have never seen a Seahawks team with a record that so drastically exceeded the quality of the team. Seattle has a good team, maybe borderline very good team, but this record and playoff seating blows my mind. For those bothered by my pessimism, please remember the bit about being a fan since the 1980s. That gives me grounds for being skeptical. <laughs> no, that that's a, that is solid reasoning, you know, there in a solid excuse, really, because I, I can I can totally understand that. But I think we all feel like this particular squad has overachieved above their talent level record wise, more so than any other team in this Pete Carroll era. Well, and I think it it gets hammered into our minds, everybody pointing out week after week, you know, the the Seahawks having a point differential of 26 points over the other teams. And so all these games are close. I I don't necessarily care about it either, but I think that that feeds into that sentiment a little bit. Sure, it does. I think the part of it that feeds into that the most is watching this team... (sighs) play up and down to their opponent week in and week out. And I think that does make it very confusing to try to figure out. I don't know if that's it either, though, because that's something that we've come to expect from Pete Carroll teams just over the years. I think True. I think it has more to do with the fact that this might be the worst defensive team that we've seen under Pete Carroll mm. maybe since the he took over the Seahawks. Yeah, I think that's actually a pretty good point there. I think maybe that is what it is, that we're just... We were having a hard time wrapping around our heads around the idea that defensively speaking, not not the best effort we've had. And it does go to the pass rush, especially. And when you don't have, I, I think you nailed it uh, a week or so ago when you said if this team doesn't have Clowney, Anza, Keem, Ke- yeah, Keem and Jaron Reed as the front four guys that are pass rushing, then they don't have a pass rush. Yeah, it all falls apart. We need all of them at once. And maybe that's what they're shooting for going down the stretch here and, you know, resting guys these last couple games. I get it. I'm just really hoping Clowney's ready to go week 17. I'm really hoping Diggs is ready to go 17. Like, if they are, like, then we have a legitimate shot at this number one seed thing. And that would be outstanding and just really a testament to the grit of this team. And, you know, we sit here and we talked about this team through the whole first half of the show. And I, I, to Pepper's point, like we're all kind of, uh, I don't know what's going on here. Defense isn't good. And we're all just like worried. We're 11 and three people. <laughs> we're in the one seed. This is amazing. And I think this is the hardest team to enjoy at this level of production at 11 and three in the number one seed so for some reason. And I can't quite put my finger on it. And I think maybe the defense thing is right the way that you put it. Yeah, that has to be what it is for me, because I think that I think we have been conditioned to enjoy good defense. And when you have a guy like Russell Wilson, who's slinging it all over the field and racking up points, we've complained in the past about the offense not putting up that kind of production. But you look at things like DVOA and the Seahawks are ranked as like the number one passing team in terms of DVOA. And I think we need to recognize that. Yeah, it really is more of an offensive centric team. And it's, it is, we, we've all been, you said the word conditioned. 
I mean, I've always loved defensive football. That's always kind of been where, you know, my mindset's been. But Pete Carroll really has uh, brought about a mentality that we all subscribe to that it's defense first and then everything else falls into place from there. And so when we do see Russell Wilson throwing it all over the yard, we're like, well, that's all well and good, but that's not sustainable. <laughs> like, well, I forgot, even though it's totally sustainable because Russell Wilson has been unbelievably sustainable and consistent, but it's just hard to believe it's a style we're not used to. And um, maybe that's the, the case is we're all just having a slow time adjusting to it. And it's Pete Carroll's fault. It's all Pete Carroll's fault. Dang. I blame him. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's his fault. Uh, just to be able to have a team that wins in so many ways consistently over the years, you know, another year of double digit wins, you know, I think that this will be his eighth playoff team in 10 seasons with the Seahawks. So yeah. only missing the playoffs twice during the, his time as the, as the coach of the Seahawks. First year and then a couple of years ago, right? Uh, I, it was the second year because it was the first year he made it with Hasselbeck with the Beast Oh, with Craig, Hasselbeck, right. And then it yeah. was then, yeah, uh, T-Jack the, the next T-Jack year, year that they missed. Yeah. yeah. Although both seven to nine years, yeah. No, B, is it uh, Pete Carroll or Bill Belichick? Who is the, the best MacGyver uh, coach in the NFL? Well, you know, Belichick's a cheater, so I think it, it has to fall to Carroll. Oh, can I, I? I do want to address that real quick. You uh, remember how I like went off on that whole like you know video thing with the Bengals and everything? Yeah. And, and then Jay Glazer came out with the video. Yeah. And you listen how brazen <laughs> those dudes were, the videographers. I take it all back. <laughs> I take it all back. Well, that's I, some bold catfish. I am still reserving the fact that they may have taken the worst seconds from that video of, of talking with the videographers but yeah it does it doesn't it doesn't sound good after you hear the audio does it uh, not at all man <laughs> well, like, i'll, I'll delete the, it I'll, de- I'll delete it it'll be fine <laughs> well not only that it's more that's not even the part that bothers me the most and that's what most people focused on the part of that that bothered me the most was that yeah that assistant isn't down there at all yeah yeah i know i know but we're <laughs> We're just filming down here. But the, the assistant that you're supposed to be filming is not down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. I just I just need to, you know, look down yeah, here. Yeah, not oh, am I doing something wrong? Not <laughs> that's what No, the, just it was the it was just the blatant brush off and just like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. And then when they finally called him out for the next time, well, so whatever, man. I'll just delete it then. Give me a break. Yeah, yeah, it's a little weird. All right, so I this is this is my mea culpa to Dave Bloomquist, uh, <laughs> the Cheatriots are a real thing. Wow. It took a while, but you got there. I did. Want to send a big thank you to Noah Young for up sending us some updated graphics for us to use on social media, the show cover art. I, I might have to make some new stickers now, but I do. I have all the art. I just I haven't quite changed everything yet. But when you do see it, it's because Noah Young, he put in the work and uh, and made those updated graphics for us. Yeah, so I was fairly proud of designing the the little logo with the, the you know help from the DCH, right? Mm-hmm. But Noah, he take it to a whole new level. Like it, it's it's so much better. Like really appreciate it, man. And it's all very subtle changes, but they all work really well. They do. Yeah, the and I'm a little emb- yeah. I'm a little embarrassed. And just the the arrangement of the font or of the the words and it's all it's just subtle good design and it, stuff that I don't have the talent to do. So thanks, man. Well, thanks to Noah. Thanks to Robert. And thanks to our flock for helping keep this show ad free. You know, after after doing the field goal stuff for the season, it, it makes me feel so much better coming over here. I don't have to worry about putting in breaks or anything like that. This this is the way I like to do the show. Yeah, it's way better. And, you know, I feel I, I feel more guilty, though, when it's tough to like get a show out because of all the people that donate. Yeah, it where it, I would feel less guilty if it was just some random corporate, you know, advertiser that I don't really care about. Yeah, but I care about you guys, so then I feel more guilty. So thank you for the guilt trip. It's really great. It's having the flock that uh, that you want to get the show produced for and out there for, and on a week like this, especially coming down to the wire. And I know you're all over the place with your travel, so I, I was really glad that we could make this work this week. Oh, me too, man. Hey, and it was fun. Well, a couple more emails from the flock before we get on out of oh. here. Oh, we got more. Okay. I know. I, know. I, felt, I, I felt us kind of wrapping up, but I realized we had uh, at least two more emails here. So 
Okay, uh, all right, that's fine. I'm just saying that 5 a.m. is 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 early tomorrow. Well, Levi in Australia will appreciate the fact that we get to his email it says good day, Brandon and Adam. It's certainly good day. A- yeah, <laughs> it's certainly yeah. been a while since I've emailed, and I've got a few things to cover. In Australia, the time zones do suck. You're right. Nothing is more frustrating than having to get up at 4:30 a.m. to watch the game, and at halftime have breakfast, very important, and get off to work. (laughs) The last quarter is usually missed. When the Hawks play in prime time, the game is on at lunchtime. I watch it on my lunch break and don't really do much work afterwards. The other tradies on site know this, and I'm now responsible for keeping them updated with scores from their team and, of course, from ours. It's a very good system. The second thing I'd like to point out is the 49ers fan that had the audacity to email in on our show and bag on our team for losing. Adam told him exactly how things were last episode, and boy, did I love it. Look after (laughs) your own backyard first, mate. Thanks for holding the number one seed for us, but we'll take it from here. I love that as Hawks fans, we can celebrate and have banter with other fans and not be dicks about it. Thank you so much for all you do in the land down under. It's hard to keep on top of press conferences, injuries, upcoming games, getting around to watching all the games is a tough gig. You two make the drives to and from work worthwhile. Don't ever stop doing what you do. In closing, we're playoff bound. Screw the Rams, screw the Cardinals, and screw the Winers. Signed, your fave Seahawk Aussie. Thanks, Levi. Yeah, appreciate that, Levi. I I also appreciate the fact that uh, me calling out that 49ers fan uh, that he deemed that I wasn't being a dick about it. And I, I appreciate that the most. It is. It's important. I, I think that we can have a little fun. You know, I'll probably be talking to Oscar uh, coming up this week in advance of the week 17 mm-hmm, game. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that's always been a guy that we've always been able to have a good, healthy back and forth for. Uh, yeah, with. And for uh, sure. yeah, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can forgive people for just having, you know, bad life choices. If that's the worst life choice that they make is rooting for a rival, then I think we can find ways, you know, other common ground amongst one another. Yeah, but here's the thing, though, Brandon. If you do have such poor judgment that you've become a fan of either the 49ers or the L.A. Rams, uh-huh. then that is more of an indicator of the idea that you've probably made some really, really bad life choices elsewhere. It's more like, you know, just... <laughs> Your manifestation of just being a catfish, like just roll out. Like that's where it comes out Uh is in that fandom. Yeah. Expressing that fandom as a 49ers fan or a Rams fan. Sure. Maybe other bad life choices. I'm saying if that's they probably kill kittens is what I'm getting at. (laughs) Well, see, that's they probably kill kittens. That would be worse. A worse life choice than picking the 49ers. I'm saying that's what I'm saying. if, If picking that team like the Rams or 49ers, if that's the worst then I, I feel like we can still be friends. See, I don't think it is the worst. See, I think it's a lot like a serial killer. Like <laughs> when they're kids, they start killing animals and then they eventually start killing humans. Uh-huh. Like you become a Niners fan. Then you start drowning kittens. And then next thing you know, like you're the Zodiac. That's how it works. Okay. Now it's a slippery of, slope. Now I kind of feel like you're being a dick about it. <laughs> I am. Um, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> One review here before we get on out. It just says, go Hawks. Just subscribe and enjoy the fantastic Hawks discussions. Best podcast for the best team in the NFC. F the Niners, F the Rams, go Hawks. See, they get it. <laughs> they totally get it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's get on out of here with our better at life this week, Adam. And let's give it to the Seahawks Pro Bowlers. Russell Wilson and Bobby Wagner making the Pro mm-hmm. Bowl squad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Only, only two Pro Bowlers, even though we have a 11 and 3 football team but uh a lot of guys on the alternate list i, I thought was uh, interesting uh, you know Dwayne brown on the alternate list chris carson with almost 1200 rushing yards jadevian Clowney, quandre Diggs made the alternate list uh, that was an interesting one to me yeah yeah shaquille griffin mike upati and tyler lockett all uh, all on the alternate list yeah yeah well i mean it's great that russ and bobby made the uh the popularity contest team that that's nice. How does Michael um, Dixon though, win the vote, the popularity vote and not get on the team that if I think automatically, if you're getting votes more than any punter, more than any kicker for special teams, that ought to be reserved for a popularity contest. Yeah. If people um, care enough to vote for them, we got to put them in. Yeah. How did that happen? By the way, did he put together like some sort of like 
Pro Bowl campaign, like a like a like a presidential campaign to get all those votes. I don't I don't care how it happened. Did I just he bribe know that he the entire it. continent of Australia to vote? Probably. Okay. All right. I was just checking. And with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. <laughs>